All right, guys, we are live on the Thrift Store Profits webinar. I've got uh, my good friend, Matthew, who's going to take the lead here and show you guys what he's kind of been showing me the last few months. Um, he's actually the, uh, we go way back, we, we both had cancer. We went to a chemo camp together in, in Montana. And uh, it's really not called chemo camp. It's, um, it's just a cancer camp where, you know, you go to like be around <laughs> other people with cancer. And uh, it's funny now because we're healed and better. That was good 15 years ago. But um, we've kept in touch ever since then. And he hit me up at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. And he said, dude, you got to flip weights, man. These, you got to flip weights. And he kept annoying me about weights. And I was like, I'm not going to flip weights. They're too heavy. I'm not doing it. And, uh, and so then I realized, like, all right, I guess I'll try it out because phones kind of slowed down. And, man, I ended up flipping so much weights that I bought him some, like, what was that Johnny Walker blue or something? Yeah. You sent me a bottle of Johnny Walker blue label. You're like, dude, I made like 14 grand. I'm what's your favorite whiskey. <laughs> so I, I got did. a Johnny Walker blue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did one deal where I made like three or 4,000 on, on one, uh, one flip. But anyway, um, so he keeps hitting me up on these, uh, these, these thrift store deals. And I kept thinking like, this is again, like this isn't really my thing. I'm used to buying something that I know I can get for 500 and I know I can sell for 600. And he's like more, more or less like digging for gold where I'm sort of buying common items where I know it's a little bit undervalued and I can mark it up from there just a little bit and sell it. Whereas like he, he could find like some, you know, rare treasure and, uh, and trade and maybe trade up to something even better from there. <clears throat> and, you know, and I was like, you know, what, this is cool. And I talked to a lot of people on a weekly basis that, they really want to get started flipping this or that. But the truth is money is tight. And when you're flipping flip thrift store stuff, a lot of times these, these prices are very low. You can negotiate really well. And, um, you know, you can go from a dollar to a hundred, you know, you can go to $10 to a to thousand dollars, like based on what I've seen him do. So um, I'm gonna let you take it away from here. I'm gonna make you the host, Matt. Give me just a second. Can she hear it? Her volume? All right, you want the host? You want lemon? Sorry, hang on. I gotta get somebody uh, muted. No, I just muted him because he made oh, me good. host. Oh, good. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know how long to do that. <laughs> oh, man, take it. All right. Uh, all right. Let's see. I'll share presentation. Let's get going on this. Um, can you all? Is it showing? Is it showing this? Can you all see yes. that? Yes, we can. All right, let me move this stupid, uh, I need to move this uh, bar that's in my way here. All right, thanks for that intro, Jeff. Uh, I threw this uh, PowerPoint together um, this weekend, so I, I hope everybody finds it useful. Um, so this is the art of thrift store flipping. Um, just the agenda, I'm gonna give a little background. Uh, what to purchase, flipping purchases, and additional ways to make money. Um, who am I? Why are you listening to me? I've been, man, I've been flipping collectibles and antiques and things like that since I was a little kid. Um, I was always a kid that had a lot of hobbies, but I came from a poor family. We never had any money. So I would buy things, flip things in order for me to buy things that, um, uh, you want me to admit people, Jeff? Let me. Yes. Yes. Uh, right, cool. Yeah. Cause I, I no longer see when they come in. So just, if you see them, it'll pop up in the middle of your screen, I think. All right. Cool. Uh, get them on. Yeah. Here. Cool. Thanks man. So I would, I would, I would uh, buy things and flip things so I could buy things that I was interested in, whether it was magic cards, comics, didn't matter. I did all that nerdy stuff when I was a kid, uh, sports stuff. So I've been doing this a long time. And as I got older, you know, it just became a hobby to me, like a game to do this. And then I, I become really successful at it as an adult. As I, as I got more money, I could buy more things, flip more things. I, I could go to more events, um, different places to do this. Um, what I want to get, off, uh, uh, get in your mind right off the bat is the mindset. This isn't like a Facebook marketplace or eBay flip. Um, I know a lot of people in here, they might have their niche where – they're buying and selling immediately for profit. Like Jeff, uh, this is what Jeff does. Those that know Jeff, you'll buy a phone. You know you can buy it for X, sell it for X pretty much immediately. Um, this is not the same 
uh, marketplace and eBay, the sellers or the buyers come to you. What I'm about to teach you is you got to go find the seller. And that's a very different mindset. You're also not assessing monetary value. You're assessing your collect the collector value of the item. If you bring something to a collector, it's worth more money than if you were to look on eBay. Uh, to be honest, a lot of collectors, they may not go to eBay for a lot of their items. They want to see it in person or are they a set they have a different value to it this is what i've found i've gone to thrift shows antique shops things like that so you want to start i want you to start thinking about collector value versus monetary value um another example if i was to search a collectible you may see a thousand of those collectibles on ebay um you know but you may have one if you were to show it to somebody in your area where there's not a thousand of those that you're going to get more of a profit and i'll explain that as we get into it um, again, you need to find the buyer. They don't come to you. I'm going to teach you about trading up. Sometimes something you buy may not have a, a major collector value or monetary value you can see, but you can really use it to trade up or sweeten a deal uh, so that you can get a higher item. Um, there's a low investment. Most things are under $5 or, or very minimal investment, but man, they can have a high payoff. Um, so just just get in that mindset. You're you're not you're not going into a store to buy something to immediately flip it uh, right away for profit. Sometimes you can, but but sometimes it takes a you gotta you gotta get it's a different process. Um, before you do this too, you want to determine your profit margin. How big is your profit margin gonna be? Um, when I started out when I was younger. You know, my profit margin was like five bucks. If I could make five dollars on it, I was getting it, and I was slinging a lot of stuff out the door. Um, that was my margin. As I as I'm a little older now, I have a full time job. You know, I do this as a hobby. Um, I go for big bigger ticket items now. Things I know I can really get my bank for my buck. Um, so starting out, um, determine what your profit margin is going to be. What what do you want to make? Um, some people that have reached out to me to do this as they've seen me be successful, they pass on items they can make 10 bucks on. They're like, you know, I only want, I'm, and it's not even worth my time unless I'm making, you know, 25 to 50 on it. Like they, they pass it up. So you need to determine what your margin is going to be because that's going to determine what you look for and how you approach a thrift store or a, a, an antique shop or a thrift convention or whatever. Um, so, um, Keep that in mind too, as you're going through this, um, you're going to have a toolkit. This is your toolkit. If you're, if you're a flipper in the thrift environment, you want a cell phone, you got to be very familiar with Google reverse image search. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of you probably are, or the eBay barcode search. Um, and you need to have a plan of attack. Um, and what I mean by that is look up thrift stores in your area, look up thrift conventions, thrift shows. If you're in the DC area or in Virginia, we have like the big, uh, at the Dulles Expo, there's like a thrift antique convention and there's a CSA autograph collectible show. You're talking about 400 booths of people that have like their fellow flippers or pickers. Um, and I make a lot of money at those just bringing stuff to trade and flip and, and sell that I get for, from thrift stores. So I have a plan of attack, like uh, line up some different thrift, sh thrift stores in your area, um, line up how you're going to approach each one. Um, for example, the thrift stores have a layout, you know, clothes, books, toys, appliances, uh, you know, they have, they have it laid out in a specific way, like a general store. Uh, depending on your niche or what you're looking for and your profit margin, you want, you know, you don't want to waste your time walking around areas where you're not really going to flip things. So you want to go in there for a purpose to, to look for those items. Um, I call them grail items, uh, items that are going to give you max profit, um, items that are going to give you, for me, it's autographs or, you know, sign things that I know I can flip immediately. I can make a lot of money. Um, you know, it's things that I know are highly collectible, you know, that diamond in the rough. So, you know, when you go into a thrift store, kind of have, and ha have that, uh, ha have a, a method, um, be methodical in your search. Um, I see a lot of people overlook things. A lot of people message me and say, like, 
I'm not finding anything. I'll say, well, take a picture of the rack for me and send me a picture of the rack. And sometimes I can see things where they're just not, they're not noticing the value in it. Um, so, so have a method, keep that in your mind as we go through this. Um, what to look for. Um, these are, I'm going to explain kind of what I look for. I have an open mind, like anything that catches my eye, um, anything that um, my senses kind of tell me I should look at, I go for, I kind of call it my sixth sense um, because I, I've been good at this. Like I, I find things all the time to flip for cash. And it's my dad was amazed one time when I went into a store because I made like 500 bucks and it was like often of, off of nothing he would have never have looked at. Um, so I call it my sixth sense and, and think of it like, if you've ever been looking at something, it's, it's making you stop all of your, your mind is processing that item faster than you realize. Like you're, you're stopping to look at it, but you don't realize yet why you're looking at it. All of your experience, all of your knowledge, everything is telling you there's something about that item that makes it profitable but you, you haven't really, your mind hasn't caught up to you yet. Like you're not aware of it yet. Um, don't ignore that. Um, you're onto something. So I keep an open mind. I'll see something and something just, um, you know, trust that, that feeling um, and, then, and then investigate it. Um, so I'll get into what I look for. Um, these are sort of, these are things, I have a lot of niches. Some people in here aren't going to have, you know, you may have one niche, it may be sneakers, it may be a different thing. I got a lot of things that I kind of look at and that over the years I've gained an expertise in. Usually it stems from me having that sixth sense about an item. Something will stand out to me and then I get really excited. I want to find everything out about that item and then that'll, that'll lead me kind of into a niche. Like I explore it, I find out it's worth a lot of money um, and I'll go into it. So at, at a thrift store, these are things I noticed that I can make money on and that I've made money on. Um, jerseys, uh, you, sometimes you find them autographs, just autographs in general, hats, baseballs, different collectibles, um, action figures, GI Joes, um, anything 90s right now is like taking off like wildfire. You can make big money on them, especially if they're in the package. Anything vintage or rustic, um, this is more for like, home goods. Like I started this going with my girlfriend and she was looking like putting things in the cart. And I'm like, why are you putting that, you know, wooden crate thing in the cart? And, you know, when I started going to these thrift stores, I noticed that people have tables just lined up with things that are vintage or rustic or natural wood. And it's all things I see at the thrift store and they're making bank on it. Um, you know, so like that interior decorating, like mindset kind of comes out, like, would somebody want to buy this? If I staged it, you know, in a thing, could I, could I sell it? Uh, you know, shoes, I, I come across Jordan's, you know, early nineties shoes all the time, stuff that you can flip. Um, political memorabilia is hot. Um, you know, at any party, you can find stuff like that, sign stuff um, that also crosses over into books. Uh, precious metals, um, a lot of time thrift stores don't even look if it's silver, gold or an actual diamond. So um, I found actual diamond rings and stuff in thrift stores, you know, in junk boxes. They don't even look sometimes. Uh, antiques, uh, vinyl records. Man, you can find a lot of records for like 10 cents at a store <laughs> and make some money on them. So keep an open mind. Don't limit yourself to this. I, I branched off of this. You know, there's a lot of money to be made in, in every area of the thrift store. It's just, you know, you got to determine what, what, you want to spend your time learning about or what you think you can flip. Um, one of the big things I find a lot of at thrift stores is autographs. Um, a lot of times thrift stores uh, will have bags of baseballs, like a mixed bag of baseballs, $3.99. I will roll over the baseballs and a lot of times I find autographs. Sometimes I find Hall of Famers. Sometimes I find just regular players. You never really know. Um, you will find autographs on hockey sticks, pucks, golf balls, underneath the bill of hats, you know, like just check under the bill, um, jerseys, um, books, uh, stuff in frames. I found like Super Bowl tickets. You'll find all kinds of stuff that, you know, a kid went off to college and they just dumped everything from in the room at the thrift store. So you never know where you're going to find them. Um, 
Yeah, Jeremy, I see you got your hand up, man. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, okay, so not to interrupt you or anything, but I, and you, maybe you were on your way to actually answering this question, but I used to, you know, uh, just go into some of the, uh, one of the first things I did when I was first getting into this was just going to like the clearance section of say like Target or a Walmart or something. And you can just as easily use like a QR code scanner linked to your eBay account. So that it just very quickly goes to uh, the, you know, and you can filter it as much as you want, um, you know, from like highest price to lowest or whatever, and quickly find out how much that uh, item is going for, considering you might end up in places where a QR code isn't necessarily available. Um, would you suggest a particular site or resource for being able to, because obviously most of us are not as seasoned as you as far as like, you know, understanding the inherent value of some of the antiques. So is there a resource that you would recommend that people visit um, just to get a general idea of what they're looking at? Yeah, I'll get into that in the flipping section, but I'll tell you right off the bat, um, Facebook has like every collector group known to man. So what I tell people is if you're going to do this, your best friend is Facebook. And like, say you find like <clears throat> a Star Wars doll or a Star Wars autograph. Um, I go, I go look for Star Wars autograph collectors. I'll go into that group and I'll, I'll post and I'll teach you how to do that. I'll teach you how to, how to put a teaser post out there. I call it a possum post and to get interest in your item. Um, because remember, if you're going to eBay, eBay and marketplace are a good way to kind of find an item. A lot of times that's an appliance or something like that. But when you're talking about a collectible, um, or something vintage, there is always a Facebook group. I know to give you an example, Jeff went to the thrift store um, prior to this talk with us with his son. And he asked me, like, what about VHS tapes? And I found a VHS tape collector's Facebook group. And I'm like, this is where you go, man. Just search it. See if it was see what's coming up. So um, it gets back into that. You have to go find your buyer for a lot of this. You need to go to the collector because the collector is going to maximize your profit. So that's a mindset you need to get into. Um, there is profit to be made by scanning the, 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 you know, the, the codes and everything like that. And like, um, you know, that happens a lot of times with electronics, uh, new items you find in, in, the, in the box at thrift stores. But the big money to be made, I'm talking, for example, flipping like a, I found a Teddy Roosevelt framed autograph, flipped it for a couple thousand. Um, finding stuff like that, uh, you know, it, it takes a different, you have to go out and find that item and find somebody to buy it. Um, you get more money that way. So I'll get into that more when it comes to flipping the item. Uh, th this section quick is just to talk about what, what to look okay, for. Okay. Yeah. Things I, I figured, I, I just wasn't sure if I was preemptively or prematurely asking that question. So no, it's a good Thanks. point. It's a teaser, man. I'll get I'll get into that and how to how to actually like possum post and stuff like that. So, but uh, so yeah, look look. So when you go into the thrift store, look. Sometimes things aren't always as they seem. That's the point of this autograph section. Not many people would think of looking at a baseball inside a random bag of baseballs. Not many people would think of looking under the bill of a hat or looking in a book to see if it's autographed. They're all the same price as the ones that are. It's just finding those items and where to look. Um, another question I had is like how to authenticate um, or find out who signed it. Um, I'm telling you, you're, if you go into a thrift store, I guarantee you can find an autograph. I'm telling you right now. Um, that's why I'm going into this. Um, look for team logos, look for, uh, um, like your area, if there's a team, look at the first and last name and do a search of the team. Um, autograph collectors groups are great. You can post a baseball that's autographed and say, Hey, I found this in a lot of baseballs. Does anybody know who signed it? I've never not find who signed my baseball or find my, sign my item. Um, how to determine if something is a famous autograph. Um, I get asked that a lot. Uh, one way is what does the autograph look like? If it looks pretty and it looks like the person signed a lot, it's probably a genuine one. 
Um, regardless, you're probably paying around 99 cents. So if you strike out, you could probably still sell the baseball for 99 cents if you wanted to. But generally, you can look at an autograph and determine by how clean it is, whether it's, a, it's an autograph you should buy. Um, so I'll give you a quick example. This is a faded one. Um, not worth a ton of money, but it's a, it's a good ball to start with. You can see it says, uh, it actually says Orioles manager 2000s, and I can't make out the last date. It's an S and a P. So I just did a search of S and P Orioles managers uh, 2000s, and then I just filtered down and I found them. It's Sam uh, Perlozo uh, signed this ball. So it's, uh, you know, that's a way you can just do a quick search to find out who, I, I do this in real time at the thrift store. I think I bought that ball for like 50 cents. Um, you know, that would, I would call this a trade up item uh, to sweeten a deal if I was a trade up. Um, you can see here's a clean ball would sell at 55, um, but you can see the, 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 it matches pretty close. Um, so I would say that would be genuine. Um, they're not asking you to authenticate a lot of times uh, people at shows and stuff like that. Um, they're gonna look at it and use their experience like me. Uh, flipping the item. Uh, this is probably the most important part of the presentation. Um, you need to find your buyer. So I use the VHS collectors traders group. When you find an item that you think is that, you know, that really sparked your interest or you think uh, is worth some money, um, even if you looked on eBay and it's selling, you can make like 25 to $50 on an item. You're going to get more profit value if you go find your buyer. So um, I always search Facebook to see if there's a collector's group. I join, I read the rules. I will search my item or the category of my item. Um, so say it's like a Josie Wales VHS tape. I will look up Clint Eastwood in the group. I will look up VHS, other, you know, Clint Eastwood VHS. I'll look up Josie Wales. I will do my research in the group. I will find people that might be interested in this item and then I'll message them uh, and, and, and see if they're interested in it. And be like, hey, you know, I noticed you were interested in Josie Wales. I, I have this VHS tape. Is this something you'd be interested in? Like, would you, you know, I don't, you know, I, I was going to just whatever, you know, make your little pitch. Um, I do what's called a play possum post in these groups. I'll read the rules and I'll follow the rules. Um, that is a Leonard Nimoy signed U.S. Air, Airways ticket that I found at a thrift store. Um, and I picked. Um Obviously, Leonard Nimoy is dead, and he's one of the most popular Star Wars or, or uh, Star Trek characters <laughs> on the planet. Um, so I'll pe I'll do a possum post. What a fantastic May the Fourth mail day! You know, blah blah blah. I'll just do a post and put it out there. I'm not selling it. I'm just putting a post out there showing my item. Um, a lot of times, you will have people comment on the bottom. I want that. Like, I've been looking for that item. Like, I am very interested in that item. A lot of times they won't post, they'll just message me. Hey, would you sell this? I'm really interested in this. Like, this is, I've never seen anything like it. Or, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, so I'll put out a teaser post and then see who's interested in the item. Um, I, nine out of 10 times, I get somebody interested in the item. They message me. Um, and that's when you just negotiate and haggle. Um, because if you were to look at eBay for a Leonard Nimoy signed item, the prices are going to be all over the place. You're not going to be able to ascertain the collector's value of this item just by looking up a Leonard Nimoy signed eight by 10, because it's not the same thing. So you have to determine the collective, the collector value, which is what somebody is willing to give you or what you negotiate. Some of these items don't have a, a set price. It's what you determine somebody's going to pay for it. Um, it's artificial. It's, it's, I mean, it could be $200. It could be $500. It could be more than that. Um, it's all about how interested the person is in the item, um, which is what makes this so fun because it's like a game to try to determine what you can get. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think I bought that U S airways ticket for like 10 bucks. Um, I flipped it for 500. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big, it's an item I spent little on, and it's an item I flip for big money. Um, and it's all because I took the time to go to an autograph collector's group and just put a possum post out. Um, I also 
wasn't really sure it was Leonard Nimoy. I just have uh, some experience with Star with Star Trek, so I kind of thought it was him. Um, so I mean, it's just one of those diamond in the rough finds. Me taking my time and finding an an autographed item, um, and then doing the work to sell it. This takes more work and time than buying something and flipping it on Marketplace or eBay. It does. But the payoff can be a lot bigger. The profit margin is significantly bigger because you're spending, you know, under $5 a lot of times to buy stuff like this. So if you're willing to put the time in, you can make big money on it. Uh, Ryan, do you have a question? Hey, Matt. Uh, yeah. yeah I, was just, I was just curious. Where did you find that, that ticket stub again? It was at a thrift uh, convention, uh, the Dallas thrift thing. It was just sitting on a table. Oh, wow. So someone was just selling it for like five bucks. Yeah, somebody had it on a table. They said, uh, I think the person said they found it in a, in a book. Um, it was in a book they bought at a thrift store, and they, it was like a bookmark. <laughs> wow. So they, had, they didn't know who it was. They just had it on there, and I was like, man, that looks like Leonard Nimoy to me. So I just bought it off a whim. So... If you're willing to put in the time, you know, you can really gain experience to make a big, big profit. But the trick is to this, the thing I want to get across is you have to find your buyer. You have to find an item that, that kind of generates an interest that you're interested in. And then you have to go find your buyer. Um, and, and I just use Facebook. I use Facebook groups. Um, I use, as you sell to people, you'll build like a Rolodex of buyers. A lot of my buyers now are repeat buyers. I can walk through a thrift convention and say, Hey, found a Mickey Mantle ball. Are you interested? Like, I know a guy that like loves Mickey Mantle because I've sold him stuff before. I know a guy that loves political memorabilia. Um, I love, a, I, I know a guy that loves presidential autographs. Um, so like you gain a Rolodex of people that you know, if you find an item, you can resell to them by being in these collector groups. Um, so this is something that you build up over time and then your profit increases and you happen to, you can sell things quicker. Um, trading up, trading up is a, uh, is something I love to do. Um, I, it gets me excited. It's, uh, it's sometimes you will find things a lot of times you'll find things in thrift shop, thrift stores like uh well jeff uh, i'll use jeff again you know he found a sarah palin signed book at a, at a thrift store they're not going for much online but to a political collector um it's worth a lot more than it is on ebay i can tell you that and at a thrift convention a lot of these people believe it or not they don't sell on ebay they don't like the fees they don't like, you know, they like doing person to person. Um, and when they're seeing it, holding it in their hand, it adds more value. So I will bring things that I wouldn't necessarily flip on eBay or I can't really, I wouldn't necessarily flip in a group. It's something that I'll, I'll use to kind of trade up for a higher value item or use it to sweeten the pot for a bigger trade. I love trading. Trading is like the picker flipper, like at a show like this, um, it can happen at an antique shop. Uh, antique malls are awesome for it. Uh, you know, thrift shows, swap conventions. I don't know if you guys have those, but we have swap conventions. People just bring shit and swap it. Uh, consignment shops. Uh, a lot of times, like, uh, there's like a signed, uh, uh, I know there's a local book in like Alexandria that'll, that'll buy signed books. Um, a lot of times, it's friends, neighbors, and acquaintances, people who don't necessarily collect, but they're interested in the item. You can trade up, trade it, try to get something, um, which I traded some stuff to Jeff for that Sarah Palin book. So uh, we did a little trade. Um, so step-by-step -step guide on how to do this. There's a method to this. You don't just walk into a thrift store and drop your stuff on a counter. Um, for example, at the Dulles Expo, uh, every dealer, like, like all of you, I'm sure, have a niche. You have something that you are really good with and you like to flip. Some people, it's sneakers. Some people, it's, you know, it's me. It's some type of media. Some people, it's, you know, it's, it's whatever it is, phones. 
Um, when I go to a antique mall or I go to a, um, you know, antique malls, where they have a bunch of different dealers that kind of rent a space, like a consignment shop, something like that, or a thrift, thrift convention, they pay like $100 for a table and they just sell their stuff. Um, I will find a dealer there that has the same niche of the item I'm selling. I'll find that guy that's selling signed political stuff or pop culture stuff. I'll find the person selling books. I'll find the person selling, you know, Star Wars toys, stuff like that. You know, if I have some action figures I found that I couldn't really flip on, I didn't really want to sell on eBay because it's not worth my time. The margin wasn't there. I'm not selling something on eBay if it's only five bucks because by the time you do fees and shipping, it's done. So I'll, I'll bring it to a show like that and find somebody that has that niche. So once I go there, I identify something at a table that I know I can flip fast for a higher profit. I'll look for that item. Um, if it's if I have a signed couple signed baseballs, I'll look for that one I know I can flip. Like you know, a Nolan Ryan's a good example. I flipped for a Nolan Ryan with some crap I had. Um, but I'll identify that item and then I'll pick it up and act like I'm agonizing over it. You know, I'll look at it. You know, if there's you know, I'll think about it. That guy's gonna approach you and make a deal. He's gonna approach you and. Say, they, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll knock off five bucks on that ball. If he's willing to negotiate right there off the bat, you're, you have a good chance of trading. I will usually make small talk, talk about the item, might point out a flaw on it, like it's dirty or whatever. Um, a lot of times I don't carry cash for a reason there. I just say, hey, I don't have the cash. Would you like to trade? I can trade. Um, but then I'll make my pitch. I'll say, man, I don't have, I don't have, you know, the 80 you want for this, but I tell you what, I got a couple of things. If you'd be interested in trading, I've really never had somebody that's selling autograph baseballs, not want to take a look at the stuff I have. So if I have like four or five signed baseballs of like random players from a thrift store, I paid 99 cents for, and I want a Nolan Ryan ball, Nolan Ryan balls are like, you know, 120 to 150. I know I can sell them pretty easy. I might just say, hey, I'll give you 40 bucks. And, you know, I have these three balls. And there I just spent, what, three bucks. I sweetened the pot with three baseballs. I spent 50 and I can go turn around on the phone and sell it for 125. I know I could sell it in like 10 minutes. So I traded up some of the stuff I bought at the thrift store, which I, I wouldn't necessarily get a big value on if I tried to sell it on eBay or in an autograph group. But I traded up and I, I got an item I know I can sell for a lot of profit. But it's just taking the time to be smart about picking who you're going to, identifying an item they have, and then making that flip. Um, a tip on doing this, avoid cavemen. If anybody's a flipper or anybody's tried to trade, cavemen are the people that they overprice their items and they won't budge on them. They're just stubborn. They will not move. I don't even deal with them. I, I cannot stand those people. They, a lot of times it's, I see this a lot with comics or um, uh, uh, certain collectibles. They're people that are at the show or at the antique store. They're retired. They're literally just showing off their collection. <laughs> they don't really want to sell it. They kind of got it there and they're like, if somebody is going to pay their money, they'll sell it. But usually they're overpriced and I can't, I can't flip the item. It's not worth my time. I avoid them. With that said, don't be a K-man. <laughs> you know, if you're in this game and you're buying something at a thrift store and, and you think you can get 50, somebody offers you 15, don't be stuck on 25. The name of the game a lot of times with this is flip as much as you can and try to trade up to get to that max value, you know, that big profit item. Um, so don't be – a lot of times with collectibles, the price is, like I said, it's not set in stone. They fluctuate constantly. One week, it could be 20. The next week, it could be 40. You never really know with collectibles. They kind of spike and drop periodically. So you got to find that, that profit margin that you're comfortable with. Um, if I know I'm making a profit on an item and I'm going for a bigger item, I am uh, more than happy to negotiate. With that said, I'll negotiate for a good price. Um, but I'm not going to be just stuck on a price that I want to get. I'm going to put it at a price I know I can sell it. Um, uh, one, question, one quick additional way to make money, finder fees. Uh, I make bank on finder fees. Um, 
if you're going to start doing thrift stores and you're going to uh, thrift store flipping, you're going to find buyers. Every single buyer that buys from you is going to be a repeat buyer or has the potential to be a repeat buyer because you could find a similar item. You know, you can sell them. They trust you now because you sold to them before. Um, I got a lot of people that will reach out to me and they will say, hey, Matt, I'm looking for this. Uh, the Mickey Manaball is a good thing. I have a buddy of mine say, hey, it's a guy I sold a million baseballs and collectibles too um he's like i need a mickey mantle ball he's like find me the ball uh mickey mantle balls are a high-end money value like it's not something i want to just go buy and hold on to um so i went into this uh, into a place and i'm like dude i got a mickey mantle ball right here we have an agreement if i find that item he gives me 20 percent of what i paid for it so you know i'll go around a thrift store i'll tell him hey man i'm going to the dallas expo i have about five people i do this for um, is there anything you have a list of needs and my commission is 20%. I'll go. They literally PayPal the dealer and he sends me my 20%. <laughs> it's free money to me. I just found it. I'm just the guy that found it for him. Um, when you get the expertise, um, and people trust you after that first sale, this is easy, man. You can literally, I can, I can literally walk into the Dulles Expo and probably walk out with a thousand in commission fees just from finding something for a collector because a collector doesn't necessarily trust eBay, uh, doesn't, uh, and, and he trusts me to look at it and evaluate it for him. Um, and he knows that I'm going to get it to him. Like I will, usually when he pays for it directly to the buyer, I will take the item and I will send it to him and he'll pay me the shipping too on top of my commission. Um, uh, on these finer fees, the reason I don't add, like buy it myself and then increase it is I don't want to lose trust on my good buyers. Um, they know they're getting a deal from me sometimes. Uh, for example, the Teddy Roosevelt I flipped, I, I was walking through, I bought an uh, autograph, Teddy, it was a dual autograph, Teddy Roosevelt um, on Deerskin Navy Commission, signed by him twice along with the Secretary of War from 1906, I think it was. Um, I bought it for 400 bucks in cash. I called my buddy, um, and the guy that's bought for me a, a million times and I flipped it for two grand. Now I could have sold that for higher, but I sold it to him at a good price. Cause I know he's likely to, he's going to buy from me again. I want to keep him loyal. I want to know he's getting a deal. Um, he's going to give me a lot more profit in the future. Um, so, you know, you want to keep all of these people when you're thrift store selling in your back pocket when it comes to collectibles and things like that. Um, and that's kind of what I threw together. Uh, I'm more interested in your questions than anything else. So if anybody's got any questions, let me know. First of all, that was freaking amazing, dude. That was freaking amazing. For someone like me, this is all super cool and super mind blowing because I don't do this at all. And the truth is what we do, is uh is like i would say legitimately way more boring than what you do and uh what stops someone like me from doing this more is the fact that like i get i'm addicted to like knowing i'm gonna make money on something right and you know going back to what you said like hey if you buy a baseball for 99 cents and it doesn't sell well now you have a, a cheap baseball like that's that's it there's not a, there's not a, a big loss for you there. So super cool with that. And then the, uh, the, the, um, finding stuff for other people, genius, man, it's freaking genius. Well, the, I'll say one other thing about baseballs. Um, you find like I buy the major league baseballs, like the official ones when I see them at a thrift store, honestly, baseballs are usually like not even 50 cents. Sometimes they're 25 cents. Um, and what I'll do is a lot of collectors, they don't want like a minor league baseball or a clean baseball from Walmart signed by a professional ball player. They want an official major league baseball signed by a ball player. So I buy stuff like that. And then if I see like a free signing in the paper, like, you know, lids hats always does this. They'll be like, Hey, we're doing a signing for a baseball player at the mall. I'll take those baseballs there that I paid 50 cents for. I'll get that guy to sign it. And then I'll flip it for a hundred bucks. Like, you know, so I'm always thinking about like, how can I, or a poster, how can I get this, this item that I paid nothing for? Um, or I got a buddy that, that opened my eyes to this. 
my buddy brings baseballs to events like that because like the csa show is an autograph show they sell baseballs there for like 25 bucks um he'll take like those baseballs he gets at the thrift store and he'll see he sees the people like about to buy tickets in line it'd be like hey i got baseballs for 15 bucks 20 bucks so he undercuts the show and sells them a baseball he bought at the thrift store and they're paying him in cash and it's pure profit i mean he'll, he'll make like 100 bucks just on baseballs just standing there for five minutes by the line where they're buying tickets so yeah, you gotta get clever jeremy, man it's dude awesome man jeremy has his hand up and uh ryan has his hand up if you want to i don't know how you do that on your end i think uh i think that might be from before so oh, was, ignore okay. me all right <laughs> got it yeah i guess the hand um, I, I re yeah i, I re-raised my hand um the first question I had, I think, is on everybody's mind is, um, well, first of all, this is this is a very viable and profitable model you're using here, obviously, because if, if it wasn't, you wouldn't be doing it like it's, it's would you say it's scalable, like, in a sense? Yeah. And, and you know, I like I said, I do this as a hobby. My hobbies fund my hobby. So I do this to buy my grail items for the things I'm interested in a lot of times, like I'll take my profit, invest it in uh, something I like, or I'll invest in like silver or gold. Um, you know, I don't really go, I go to thrift stores, just usually my girlfriend likes to go to them. Um, so I'll go there and I'll just do this on the side. If, if mm -hmm. I wanted to, I mean, there are guys, you can watch them on uh, Facebook video. Like there's a couple of people that do this full time and they're hating, like when I say have a plan, they will go to every thrift store and they will go to uh, a ton of, um, uh, of uh, what is it, um, uh, garage sales on the weekend. And that's what they do. And, and how, they, how they do it um, from talking to these people and seeing them, they will usually have, uh, they'll usually rent a space um, in an in a antique shop or or in a consignment shop and they'll tape their flip items into there um and they always have a booth at the thrift at the thrift conventions um sometimes they'll just stock up on my items and go there um you could scale it up but it would one guy i saw that did this and i met he actually has people that go out to the different thrift stores and then bring him stuff so that he doesn't have to go to them all the time so mm -hmm. he's trained people to kind of do the search and for them um, so there's a variety of ways you can do this, um, but it's relatively, this has been going on on the underside of like flipping for a long time. It's just that I, I guess during COVID, it kind of came to light because people started selling more stuff in their apartments and stuff more because they had more time. Um, but you can get creative with this. If you, it, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um okay. I did, yeah, I did have a couple questions for you uh, regarding that. Um, uh, one thing I was going to mention, I did see that Gary V video uh, a few, actually it was like a year ago, where he goes to garage sales and he starts buying things and flipping things. And then other people would show up and they were doing the same thing and they were more interested in, in like getting an autograph from Gary V or getting a picture with him than they were even doing the garage sale stuff. But I remember Gary V said in there, he says, yeah, but the problem with these garage sale um uh, this garage sale model doing this he's like you can't scale this in a sense what did he mean by that like it's just it's just too few and far between um it's i don't know it's a good question it depends how often you can do it i guess mm. i'm i'm really good at finding the diamonds in the rough just from my experience um i can always find something that i know is going to make me money it's just yeah. how often can you go and, and, you know, how, how much can you, how, man, I guess it's, it's tough to answer that. It, yeah, like, to uh, me, it, you can, you can, uh, you'd have to get into, you'd almost have to keep flipping up to where each deal that you do is, is a bigger and bigger commission. Um, it would be very hard to like, duplicate yourself as a uh, as a thrifter which i'm assuming is why I, you keep your full-time job yeah yeah i mean 
Honestly, I think this would be good. This is a good thing to add to your, to your, um, just to one of your tools for making money. I mean, because it doesn't take it, it, you know, it's one of those things where you can do it once a week and you can Mm -hmm. still make good profit and you could probably still find a grail item. Um, so I, I would say it's, it's not the thing you're going to want to do like since the thrift store, the sense of thrift shows are every couple of months and I'm not traveling to thrift shows, it would be hard for me to make a complete living off of it. Like there are some people at these thrift shows that that's all they do. They go from one thrift show to the next thrift show to the next thrift show and they buy and sell at the thrift show So they always have stock and, you know, they, during the week while they're traveling, they're hitting thrift shows and antique shops to fill their booth. So, I mean, in that regard, if you're doing that, but that seems like a hard life. I do this on the side of my Mm -hmm. normal work. And I I would do this on the side to to supplement your normal business. I can see that. Yeah. Um, One thing that I was, the other question, one of the other questions I wanted to ask too was, um, I would think this question's on everybody's mind is, is demographics. And I'm going to kind of preface it with another story because, you know, Jeff got me into phone flipping. I was in Florida two months ago um, with a friend who's actually been phone, who runs a phone flipping business in Florida and he's doing really well. And I worked for him. He trained me really well um, to the point where now I'm very confident about my ability with phone flipping because I can see, I've, I've had so much experience working with him. I can see what it's supposed to look like when it actually works every time. So now I have in my mind the model of what it looks like when it succeeds, like what it's supposed to look like. So now I come back home, which is here in Buffalo, New York. So now the thing is, I'm going to apply the same model that I did in Florida here in Buffalo. But the thing is, it may or may not work out because this is in Florida. You know, so um, with that said, I think I, I just want to get you like, what's your opinion like as far as like when it comes to everywhere is different. I'm sure you could probably argue I might go to a thrift, I might go to thrift stores and say like, dude, I didn't find anything. But if you come here, like, dude, I just found like thousands of dollars worth of stuff. You missed all this kind of thing. Like, what is your opinion as far as location? It's just it all it doesn't matter. Like, it, you never know what you're going to find anywhere you go. It's right. Or w- would you kind of comment on that? Um. No, I would get, I would say that you could, you could use, you could, I've been thrifting all over the United States. Um, Whenever I go somewhere, I go into thrift stores and I do this. Um, You generally have the same layout, the general, you generally have the same items, types of items. Now, with that said, you always have the potential when you walk into a store to find a big money item. They're not always going to be there, but you got to remember thrift stores are constantly, Every day you go in, they, they restock the shelves. I mean, you have stuff flowing in and flowing out nonstop. Um, the people that donate to thrift stores are usually people that are too lazy to go to marketplace. Um, so a lot of the items you see are things you could easily probably sell on marketplace. Some of them like furniture wise, stuff like that, uh, electronics, <clears throat> stuff like that. But wherever I've been in the United States, you generally see the same things at a thrift store and you, you definitely have the, the, for me, I guess it's, I guess I, it's, it's hard for me because I have so much experience with them. I just, I just know what I, when I look at a rack, what I can see, and I generally see the same sorts of things. It's just, I always seem to find something that I know I can make the profit of just from my experience. Is there an equalizer at play there in in terms of, let's say, you have a much wealthier city versus a poorer city. Are you, is it more likely you're going to find obviously better, more valuable things? Yeah, yeah, that does hit. Um, so like in DC, I get a lot of signed books from politicians and stuff like that because I'm in DC and whenever a politician leaves or a staffer leaves or something like that, they dump their books at Goodwill because they don't want to take them. So I get a lot of signed books and I get a lot of st- stuff here um, like that. When I'm in a small town, um, I make a lot of money on antiques and vintage items, 1970s, 80s, you know, cassette players, uh, you know, just just anything vintage like that, radios, um, you know, gaming systems, uh, Ataris. Um, you tend to get older vintage in a small town. 
um, opposed to a big city uh, because you get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of, um, you know, generally older people uh, donating things in a smaller town. Uh, people tend to hold on to things longer. Um, it seems like not a lot of people move a lot in smaller towns. Big cities, people are moving apartments constantly, so they're spring cleaning constantly. Um, so you see a lot of, there's a lot of newer items uh, opposed to, um, a newer signed items opposed to like vintage antique items. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. And you can make money and all that. Like I see a lot of records in small towns. Um, and that's actually exciting for me because records are huge. Um, you got a huge profit margin. You're talking 10 cents um, at a Goodwill I go to that I used to go to in Charlottesville, like outside of Charlottesville, a little town of Rutgersville. They, they were selling records for 10 cents. They were always loaded to the hilt. Um, and I mean, man, you could sell those things for bank. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. And the last question I have is, um, what is your secure payment method for the transaction when you find the, the collector on the Facebook group and, um, they're like, I want that. Like, how do you, how do you set that up? What will you do for that? Um, I usually use PayPal. Um, I have a pretty good established, um, uh record on paypal or on you know like with ebay and with and with uh a lot of the collector groups like i have reference pages and like magic the gathering groups comic groups stuff like that mm -hmm. so a lot of times people just paypal me goods and services or they'll just they'll paypal me as a friend or whatever um you know so a lot of times i'll do that if they're local obviously i'll meet up with them if they want to do that but usually usually it's paypal man safe as they way do you invoice them? Do they pay you first and then you send the item? How does it all like usually work with that? I just send them my uh, email. They PayPal me and I ship it out to them. Okay, cool. Sorry if I sound like I'm overcomplicating. No, no, dude. These, these are all good questions, man. Somebody if, if, you're at a, if you're at an event, if you're at an event, um, they will usually pay you cash, uh, which is awesome. But okay. Yeah, thank um, you. That's I all. Think I think you covered the uh, the small city. So some people were asking, like, you know, if they're living in a small city with not a lot of people, like you said, you can do antiques. Um, any other creative ways of, of getting it done as far as, uh, I don't know, as far as sourcing something in a city where you think more stuff would be? You know, like, let's say you did want politicians' books. Like, how would you uh, try to connect with somebody that's out toward the uh, Northeast and say, like, hey, look out for these books? Like, are there groups like that? where you, you can like almost like hire a buyer. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's, that's all I got for now. Yeah, no problem. That's a good, uh, that's a good question, Jeff. Um, you know, there's so many collector groups on Facebook. Um, I haven't actually done that, but that's actually a good, that's a good idea to like have somebody source. Um, I will say a couple a couple of quick tips I didn't think about um, in order to kind of, I, to kind of see what a store has a lot of, I sign up every, every thrift store now has like a rewards program If they get overstocked on something. They'll run a sale. So like, I just got one from a place nearby me that said books were 30% off. That tells me that they got an overload of books. Um, the other thing is if you go to Goodwill or places like that, they'll give you a discount. If you use like a capital one credit card, like Goodwill does this, so pay attention to those. Um, but as far as like sourcing in a small town or something like that, that's, that's a good one, man. You'd have to rely on a network. If you made a network like that, that would be a good, that could be a good model for getting uh, things into your, you know, to, for getting stock. That's actually a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> I teach a lot of people with phones and sometimes they're in a city of like 3000 and maybe like an hour away is a city of, you know, 50,000. And like you take the conglomerate of everything they have to target and they're never going to be able to make a living with that. And so that's why I like, I, yeah, that's why I, I like having you on and just kind of like for somebody like that they're going to have to take a lot of different concepts and that all is going to have to add up into like one decent business. Um, let me see. There was another question here. Give me a sec, dude. 
you want me to stop sharing? Oh, yeah, yeah. How often? Gonna... Yeah, sure, sure. How often do you uh, do you wait? You said you could go back really every day if you wanted to, but you probably say you you don't hit spots more than maybe once a week. No, I go once a week, like uh, a lot of times to kill time or whenever I want. Um, once a week for me is is good. Now, if you're if you're, I'll say this: if you if you are doing this and you're hard up for money and you, you know really are trying hard to flip there's no reason why you can't go to one as often as you want um you know they restock every day i mean if you're flipping stuff on marketplace and you're doing this and you're driving around and i mean there's no reason why you can't map and just go to the nearest goodwill as you're doing that um or go to the nearest thrift store or antique store um i just go once a week uh to different okay. ones yeah. But, uh, do you do you um do you give them like a business card and say like hey call me like if you get some sexy stuff like I've heard of people doing that do you make relationships like that or you kind of remain I have I, I do that mostly at antique shops or thrift conventions okay uh, Goodwill and stuff like that won't do it um but like if you go to care. an antique store yeah yeah or 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 uh one of the biggest one is consignment shops um you know people people are. You can tell when, when you, when you walk into a store, you can tell the niche when you walk into an antique shop, just going to one after this, when you have time, you'll see like the different booths and you'll see somebody that's probably in your wheelhouse that has something that you're interested in. That guy is passionate about that item and he's flipping it. If I'm looking for something, I will give him my card. Yeah. Uh, Ricardo, did you have a question? I think so. There we go. Yeah, I um the question is uh have you got into any like artwork because like thrift stores uh so our artwork and sometimes you can find something that might be of value absolutely um i made 300 bucks on a painting the other day um there's so what I look for, uh, I always go to the frame. Remember I said, be methodical about where you go. They're, the thrift store is set up in a specific way. Like I said, you have your clothes, um, you know, you have, you have your framed items. Um, today, when I was in a thrift store, I saw there was an original Humphrey Bogart 1949 movie poster that was framed in a frame somebody had. It was $7.99. I mean, um, but I have found paintings and you can tell they're legit paintings. They're usually on the back. They're numbered. It looks like an older frame. You can see the signature. Um, I will Google the artist. Um, the one I found recently was like a ship. It was a smaller painting. Um, and it happened to be somebody that uh, had like a lot of their paintings in California. But the smaller ones were comping at about, um, I don't know, they're like 500. I guess I sold it for three. I bought it for 20. Um, so it's one of those things where if, if I see an original painting at a thrift store and it's 10 bucks, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where it's a, such a low, think about that. It's such a low, uh, investment, but it's a legit painting that somebody did. And if it looks good, I mean, you could stage that you could flip that on marketplace. Um, a lot of times you can do to find the artist. You could do a reverse image search of the uh, of the painting and it'll bring up paintings that are similar. I've done that and match the match the signature on it, um, just because the style is the same. So I would say, man, if you see a painting and it's a legit painting, not like a copy, um, you know, it's it's worth the investment um, because you can you can definitely. I would say you're not a flipper if you can't flip a painting that you bought for you know, under a hundred dollars more because paintings have just so much value. I got a quick follow-up question. If that's cool. No problem. Okay. Um, so two real quick. Um, so have you ever run into any issues in regarding taxes? Uh, because I know that I, I know this is, usually a case by case scenario but in my experience if you do deals uh for anything more than like say 10 grand on um ebay uh you end up having to pay a pretty hefty tax but it, it's under a very specific threshold 
So I, I, you may or may not have any information on that because maybe it doesn't exist or there's ways to dodge it. Um, the other question I had was um, for any overflow that you have, like say you bought, and I would imagine this has happened from time to time where you've bought something, maybe it didn't work out. Now it's sitting on your back shelf. You're trying to figure out a way to get rid of it. Do you use any kind of farmer's markets or anything of that nature to, because like I've been to those things and people will buy just about anything if it, if it thinks that they, it will serve them. So I'm just wondering how you might unload some of your extra inventory in the event that not all your deals work out. I use them as trade-up items at the Dallas Expo. It's 400 tables. So I just throw it all in a backpack or put it in my car and, and I go trade up or I, or I try to sell it. Um, as far as taxes, the threshold was twenty thousand dollars or um, a certain amount of sales. Um, I don't hit that uh, just because you know I just I do this on the side. Um, now the threshold after the Democrats pass that Americans Whatever Act, it's six hundred dollars, um, uh, and PayPal or eBay will give you a ten ninety nine k. Um, what I was told by my buddy, who's a tax lawyer is he said, well, if eBay is going to treat you as a business and give you a 1099, what you can do is add up all of your purchases on eBay and then count it against your sales on eBay. Um, because they're considering you a business. So every, every purchase you make is a, is a business investment then. Um, and you always make more purchases than you do sales a lot of times on eBay. Um, but I haven't done it yet. I haven't. That was last year. Um, those new rules kick in on Good. January 1. So it's probably, remember, it, it, it's probably pretty safe to say to familiarize yourself with some of those laws it, with the intent of actually making a significant amount. Yeah, that's with anything, though. If you're flipping on Marketplace or anything like that, I mean, they're going to ding you if you're, if you're doing uh, – Facebook now it will even send you N99 on Facebook sales if they pay through that on um, the Facebook marketplace with that new law. But like I said, you're always making a purchase on an item and all that can be written off. So my, you know, my buddy just said, just add up the sales you have to the purchases you've had. And there's certain, there's certain rules now. I haven't talked to my tax attorney yet to do my taxes. There are certain rules that deal with collectibles that are different than like selling, buying and selling newer items. Um, but this is such a new law. A lot of people don't even know what's in it yet. So, I mean, it takes effect on like the first, it took effect on the first. So when I go in, you know, that, that would probably be a different, we're all going to have to investigate how that would impact you. But yeah, I yeah. guess the reason why I ask is because, you know, typically the, you know, the, the standard procedure is um, ask for forgiveness rather than permission, but I'm not so sure if that's the case in this regard. If you know what I mean. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> They're all required to give me a 1099. So, I mean, you know, I'll just write it off my purchases against my, uh, against my profit. Okay, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, the, the only other thing you touched on, which uh, which was a question of mine, but was covered already, is that uh, in my experience, yeah, it's very uh, it, it's a good strategic move to look up the more wealthy areas and then to hit the thrift stores around there, just because it's you know common sense. You know, they, they're going to get rid of stuff that they don't think is worth anything. So. Yeah, I mean, what I would say, though, is I've made a lot of money in small town thrift stores because the vintage items are hot, man. People, um, you know, people, if there's anybody that's into, like, home decor or decorating, like, people want those, like, old, you know, uh, one of the big, one of the big ticket items I found, it was $45. It was, like, a Drury 1950s blue beer um, cooler that they had out, and that thing's 500 bucks all day. Um so, I mean, small towns, like you get people that are clearing out like grandparents houses and stuff like that. I mean, they dump a lot of vintage stuff um, that is just worth a lot of money to people nowadays when they're decorating their house or, you know, things like that. So it's easy to, to like um, 
it's easy to like stage those items and sell them on marketplace uh, because people want those things to put in their house. So, I mean, I, I would say like uh, uh, you definitely do come across things in like a richer area because they just don't, they just don't care about researching their items. They just donate it. Um, you yeah. know, so I mean, yeah, that's and, there's something to be said with that. Yeah. And, and I, you know, uh, Jeff and I were on a call with another group uh, quite a few months ago in regards to uh, side hustling, essentially. And one of the things that I had suggested, uh, because this was suggested to me from a friend of mine who's like Bosnian, and he has like all this crazy uh, historical knowledge and stuff. Um, he, what he likes to do, and this is a little trick, I'm not sure if you've used a technique like that, it's, it, like this, it's not technically illegal by any means. But uh, you go to some of these auction houses where they're kind of just letting you, you know, mill around the property. And oftentimes, like, you'll just walk in there with an empty box and then you'll walk out with a full box of, you know, just random stuff that you may want to clean up and, you know, either collect for yourself or resell to other people. But one of the things that he mentioned to me was if you're doing that, if you see, it's kind of like going back to what you said, like you see something that catches your eye, you think like might have some real value, throw that to the bottom of the box. And then like all the other stuff that you think might be valuable, but you're not exactly entirely sure. You throw that on top of it. It's, it's kind of like from lowest value on the top to the greatest value on the bottom. Because as you're walking out of one of these places, they'll just kind of scan over the box and they'll be like, ah, oh, give me like, you know, 30 or 50 or 70 bucks for it. And they won't even check the box off the times. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to tell you more about following your gut. Um, the biggest profits I missed out on were things where I had a gut feeling and I just left it on the table. I mean, you're talking about a little investment, big payoff with a lot of this stuff. And, and like I said, you need to trust yourself because a lot of us, if you're looking at marketplace and you're reading a lot and you're, you're doing a lot of flipping in your life, there's a lot of knowledge you're just not accessing in your head, but your body is letting you know that you you're, you're seeing something that, that has potential. You're just not aware of it. Um, and when you're talking about a little profit item, um, you know, that's, it, it's just, don't ignore that feeling. Um, you know, because it's not a big investment you're making when you're doing these. And that's why this is so fun because, you know, you can, you're not spending a lot of money, but the potential is huge, especially if you start gaining expertise and you know where to go. And that's why the Facebook groups, I wanted to explain that the Facebook groups are really valuable. If you find something like this, don't go to eBay, don't throw it on marketplace, unless it's like what Jeff found in, in the thrift store when he was walking out, it's an item and appliance he knows he can flip quick um stuff like that yeah throw it on marketplace but a collectible go to the group vintage go to the group that collects it go to your buyer maximize your profit i seen uh riley you've had your hand up for a while i think he uh he messaged me he had to run and go get a uh, phone <laughs> oh, okay Look, <laughs> dude this is amazing um you know i'd encourage everybody to uh add matthew on facebook and um Honestly, if you know if, if you're planning on charging for this in the future, I think you should because this is amazing. Um, but one of the things that I get back from uh, from teaching people is that uh, like you're going to get a lot of questions, hopefully from this group that you already have and you will in the future. Um, and it's possible that people will find like when I talked about having buyers in different areas, we well, now you got 20 people that trust you in other areas that possibly could find you stuff that, uh, that's valuable that you could buy from them. You know, they're paying $1, you're buying it from, let's say, you know, 20 and then flipping it for 200 or something. So, um, you know, hopefully, uh, the value will come back to you as well. Um, but guys, I am outside and the weather has taken a turn and I'm freezing. Uh, so I'm going to shut this uh, recording off.